In our quest for the new in food, we can turn our back on the past, but I want to reclaim old favourites. Just give them the express treatment. So I'm having a real blast from the past supper and reliving my student days with a meltingly delicious cheese fondue. And then I am indulging further, oh yes, with a cherry-topped cheesecake. When I'm home alone, it's back to the kitchen of my childhood with my mother's creamy baked eggs. To make for a show-stopping supper, I'm whipping up some classics from my grandmother's era. So some incredibly crisp sole goujons with dill mayonnaise and then flametastic crepe Suzette. The past made fast. Surely when you're pressed for time, it makes sense to turn back the clock. I grew up on this street, and in one of these houses, it's the first kitchen I can ever remember, and I'm planning a return to the taste of that time, because an old friend's coming round for supper, and we are wallowing in a bout of nostalgia. Well, not so much wallowing as going for full body immersion with a meltingly delicious cheese fondue. And then maybe later on in the evening, if we've been good enough, I might bring out my cherry top cheesecake, once nearly got me expelled from school. I've atoned for it, I feel, by creating a light, luscious, even elegant cheesecake with a cherry topping that is as easy or easier than pie. 125 grams of digestive biscuits. Just put in 75 grams of lovely soft unsalted butter. You really don't need to melt this first, as people often tell you. Just blitz until you've got a soft, sandy rubble. That's done. Just tip it all into the base of a 21 centimetre spring form tin and press down. Mm. This is lovely. It feels like building sandcastles when I was young. So that's the base done. No cooking involved, so express from the off. And now for the topping, obviously cream cheese. And I've got a lot of it. A 300 gram tub, in fact and you really need to have it at room temperature. It's much easier to mix up. On top of that, you need about 60 grams of icing sugar, a teaspoon of vanilla, and because it's always good to accentuate the tang of a cheesecake, good spritz of lemon juice. A few seconds sees this all amalgamated. Look at that. I could eat it like this. And now you need 250 mils of double cream here and just whip it till firm but still soft. I do love a baked cheesecake, but they need as much attention as a newborn baby. I mean, my grandmother's instructions for a cheesecake, you know, bake it for two hours and then leave it in the oven with the oven off and then open the oven door crack and then wider, so forth. Don't want to know. This is luscious and smooth. Dangerously eatable. Obviously I'm making it as a kindness for my friend Tracy. Entirely selfless act. The cream is just as I need it to be, so just fold the two bowls of white mixture in together. doesn't matter which way round you do it. And that's it. Ready to be dolloped on top of the base. After three hours in the fridge, this will be soft set but sliceable, but before I slice, I'm topping with a fabulous dark cherry conserve. Just one thing, I know it has retro authenticity, but do not use pie filling, please. I love bits of retro kitchen gear and I'm a real hoarder. Now, take this. This coffee pod is the first thing I ever bought in my first ever flat. It's called La Signora to denote its curvy shape. This casserole was my mother's. I think she got it as a wedding present. And I still cook from it, although it is a bit on the grotty side inside, my fault. And both these salad bowls were my granny's. Oh, where's a ton? 
It's not a bad nick considering how old it is. The thing is, my granny always said to me, do not use soap when washing wood, and I don't. And look, you see, it's gleaming and clean and still in use. Ah, oh, the fondue set. Now, the sad thing is, when I was really in my fondue making days, I just supplied the hard graft and other people owned the hardware. But now I am a fully fledged member of the fondue set. The cheese fest continues with another blast from the past in the form of a fruitful fridge raid to make my cheese fondue. When I was a student, I have to say I waitressed and a lot of what I ate really was just leftovers from the fridge at the restaurant I worked at. But I'm afraid a lot of the time too I used to make raids on fridges in the halls of residence and come away with many, many different sorts of cheeses which I'd melt down into a cheese fondue for us all. I still love a fridge raid and I've yielded quite well. Four different cheeses, all of them good for cheese fondue. Got Gruyere, Emmental, Brie and Camembert. You need 600 grams of cheese all told. Don't bother to grate, it's easier just to chop. That's the Emmental done, now the Gruyere. And I love the nuttiness you get from these two cheeses. And together with that rich, creamy silkiness from the Brie or Camembert, or both in my case, fabulous. Look, I'm not trying to sell this as health food, but think of it this way. This comes from a more innocent age when people just didn't worry about the amount of fat in their food. You can go for a run tomorrow if you want. Now for the soft cheeses. Try and take the soft white skin from the brie. As soft as those kid leather gloves they sell in Italy. Delicious. And finally the camembert. I have to say, a cheese fondue is the most express route to a meal that's convivial, filling, pretty well unbeatable. Right, the cheese is ready to go into the fondue pot. Gorgeous. Need to scrape some of the soft cheese in. Mm, it's already begun to get gooey. You need 300 millilitres of white wine, two glasses, the easiest measure to understand. The heat on, let's give a little stir to help the cheese melt into the wine. And while the cheese is melting into the wine, I am going to mix corn flour and kirsch to a paste which will just help it go into the fondue without making any lumps. You don't need much corn flour, two teaspoons is fine. Kirsch just means cherry in German and this is a cherry liqueur but it's not thick and sweet like cherry brandy, it's really cherry fire water. And although it may seem odd to put a cherry liqueur, however unsweet, into a fondue, believe me it works. You can't taste cherry in it, but nevertheless, it just gives a sort of deep resonance, a hit from the woods. In the old days, people would get a bit of garlic into their fondue by cutting a clove in half and just using it to wipe around the pot. But I am just putting the whole clove in. It'll make the garlic very mild because I'm not mincing it or grating it. And some pepper. Always love white pepper. And some freshly grated nutmeg. <laughs> With this little pixie town grater. So it's time to whisk in the corn flour and kirsch. <laughs> I'm really in toy town now. <laughs> Baby whisk. You can see that it's the corn flour which amalgamates everything and thickens the fondue, makes everything satiny smooth. All I need to do is cut up a green apple, some bitter radicchio and some sprightly fennel. Oh, and some cubes of sourdough bread. Then when my friend arrives, I'll light the burner, take this over to the sofa and we can lie back and guzzle to our heart's content.
Just help yourself. I've been looking forward to this. Fondue, bit of a blast from the past. I actually haven't tried it before with apple. Whose idea was that? My mother always had apple and cheese. I love the sharpness. Why don't we look at the photos that I bought? Because oh, I'd I, love to. I got together some of the old pictures and put them in an album for you. With dread and anticipation, <laughs> I'd love to. Look at that one. Oh, my God, they, everyone thought I really was a nun. <laughs> when we were in Spain, we had some delicious tapas, didn't we? Yes. You couldn't really get it here, then. No, and it was lovely. There was the um, kidneys and sherry. Mm, I remember and that. I mean, that is the thing. Is that when I think of all our holidays, all I really remember about them is the food. <laughs> Tracy, I can't let you leave without just one slice of cheesecake. Oh. Turn on the night, will you? Famous cheesecake. I'm going to top it with some cherry jam, or really cherry conserve. Mmm. That's fantastic, thank you. I'm not going to have it right now. You're going straight in, then. Straight in. Mmm. Good. Perfect. And you see, this is what got me suspended. It was so worth it. <laughs> it's not so very surprising that the person who's had the most influence on how I eat, how I cook, is my mother. And that's my mother there. The boy is my older brother, Dominic, and the baby is me. I remember, really, like Sundays. Sunday lunch, big performance, big roast, all of us there, often quite tense. But Sunday evenings, now, they were fabulous. My mother often, after all that hectic palaver of lunch, would just do something simple, like her baked creamy eggs. And this is so wonderful but something I've only eaten in her kitchen or mine. And I feel, you know, it's churlish not to share. So kettle on and I can get ready for my oeuf en cocotte. I'm not being pretentious. It's just that my mother always called it by its French name. I think people did in those days. This is the cocotte in question, or a ramekin pattern much favoured by my granny and actually I think we had some at home as well. Anyway, what you need to do is butter, just using some soft unsalted butter, the inside of the cocotte or ramekin, just a little, and then the egg. One fabulous egg, organic, if you can, and look at the goldenness of that yolk. It beckons me. It's not even been cooked yet. About a quarter of a teaspoon of coarse salt is what I think you need here. But if you're using fine flowing salt, just a pinch, really. And now, some cream. This turns an everyday basic into an express treat. Just a bit of cream, about a spoonful. And then something to take this from blissful to ecstatic. I'm going to add a teeny drop of white truffle oil. It really has the scent of mushrooms, but at a much higher plane. But don't worry if you haven't got any. My mother would never have used this, so it is perfect without it. I just have a little weakness. I'm baking the egg in a bain-marie, which is simply this. In other words, I'm pouring water from a recently boiled kettle to come halfway up the dish. And the oven's at 375, and in 12 minutes, this will be perfect. My bagel toasted in readiness. Now a bit of a technical extraction. Made it. I'm just going to plunge in. There's nothing else to be done. Mm. Mm. This takes me right back to the Sunday suppers of my childhood. Only this is so much better because I know there's no school tomorrow.
whenever I walk past a London hotel, I always remember these wonderful meals that my granny used to take me to inside, you know, for a birthday treat, something like that. And I remember not just the food, which was lovely, so treaty, but also the whole theatrical experience. I'm rather inspired by that memory to create a retro dinner party of my own. And the thing is, I've made these recipes so incredibly fast that I have bought myself some time to go shopping for a few knickknacks to adorn the table. There are so many things I remember and love from my granny's kitchen. I've got some of them still, but I do love to go around exploring old vintage and retro shops to see what else I can find. to do it. My granny wouldn't approve. I love these. They'll look so lovely on the table when I've got my soul goujons out and something pink and fizzy in these. Chin chin. Goujons of soul have really fallen out of favour in recent years, not to mention decades. I think it's time to rehabilitate them. There is nothing like that tender fish encased in super crunchy crumb. Everyone loves them. I suppose they really like fish fingers for grown-ups. Nothing wrong in that. I've got two fillets of lemon sole here. In other words, one fish filleted, not by me. And do ask or do look on the label to make sure it's skinned and filleted. I'm going to snip these in a moment, but first the important crummage. In one plate you need about 75 grams of corn flour. In a shallow dish, two eggs. I'm going to whisk these together. Not trying to get any air in them, just making sure the yolks and whites amalgamate. And from this plate, my pièce de résistance panko. These are Japanese breadcrumbs. Want about a hundred grams. Don't worry, if you can't find them at a shop, you can get them online or use ordinary breadcrumbs. So here goes. And frankly, it's easier just to scissor the sole fillets into goujons. And I plan on getting eight goujons per fillet, which means 16 altogether. Not good at maths, but I can do that much. I always use lemon sole. In fact, I don't really think I've ever heard of a goujon of anything else, but of course you could use place. I reckon that really about 180 grams per person is fine. You don't need much. There's a slight bit of conveyor belt action here. I like that. It's rather relaxing before people come. Now dredge each little piece in corn flour. This helps the egg to stick and this in turn helps the panko or breadcrumbs to stick and my method is as follows I throw bits of panko on top rather as if I'm a child hiding something in a sand pit there we are the first one is done and the rest follow in kind I could use you know, a big pan or regular deep fryer for this, but I have to say, I always find that a bit alarming and I prefer using just 250 mils of oil and fry about four or so at a time and do everything in batches. It's much simpler. Right, the goujons are done, so I'm going to wash my hands and fry. Now for the fun part, the frying, and the oil is just hot enough. It's shimmering, but not yet smoking. I put in my first piece, ah, how I love that sound. You know you're gonna eat well when you hear that. I use grapeseed oil, you could use any vegetable oil, but I love grapeseed oil for a reason. It's got a very high smoking point, which means you can get it really very hot 
before it starts smoking. And they take hardly any time to cook. And you can tell when they're cooked very easily because as soon as these little strips are golden brown on each side, the fish is cooked. It's that easy and that quick. And as soon as they're ready, I'm going to put them on this baking tray covered with this beauteous kitchen towel. Well, sometimes you've just got to be practical. And my express accoutrements on the table, nice to eat alongside, are some little pearl onions pickled in a jar, some baby cornichon, like teeny weeny gherkins, an iceberg salad. You see, there's no stopping me now. And to be really retro, because I love them, I'm serving the goujons with some matchstick crisps. Remember those? And the final flourish, they are both going in a basket. And look how gorgeous they are, despite the kitchen towel behind them. You can see they're really crunchy on the outside, and I promise you, they will be almost fluffily tender within. So I'm going to sit them in the low oven, and I can get on with my dill mayonnaise. Now I can whip up sauce. Good jar of proper mayonnaise. Just keep it all out. And then the dill. I want really to snip one large bunch of dill, or otherwise two of those supermarket packets is fine. The traditional accompaniment to sol goujons is sauce tartare, but I don't like tartare sauce out of a jar, and all that chopping of already little things, it's pretty labor intensive. This is perfect. I want some lime juice to add a little bit of edge, teaspoon or two, depending on your taste and how sharp anyway the mayo is. Just mix everything together. I find that even good jarred mayonnaise is fairly salty to start off with, so I wouldn't add any now. So I need to decant, just ease the dill mayonnaise, incredibly scented, into the vessel of your choice. So this is done. Hard work, wasn't it? I'm going to stash this to one side so I can get ready, and then we can play with pudding. I'm preparing for my grand finale. When I was a child and was taken to these swanky hotel restaurants by my granny, the thing that I loved the most was that moment, the end of the meal, when the waiter would somberly and with due ceremony wheel a trolley towards our table, set a burner on it, and then set fire to some pancakes at the table. Oh, that was magic. And now I'm turning magician with my crepe Suzette Got the zest of one orange for the crepe Suzette syrup. And I want the juice of two. Need my impaler for this. Just squirt it straight in the pan. That's all crepe Suzette are. Pancakes in an orangey syrup flambéed with orange liqueur. And I do think for most people, crepe Suzette must be the epitome of a finickety fussy, complicated pudding to make. Let me tell you, my version isn't. So after the orange juice, that's 75 grams of sugar going in. And remember, this comes from a time when the more butter a recipe had, the more sophisticated it was deemed to be. So yes, that is 175 grams of soft, unsalted butter going in. So I'm going to put this on. I want it to come to a boil and then bubble away for about five, ten minutes. And while that's happening, I will deal with my crepe. It's as simple as opening a packet. And you can see here, let me open one. I want them quartered and, and handily for Express here, Extra Express. They are already folded into quarters. I want to open one up. You can see how thin and lacy these are. It's simply a matter of putting them in a large 
pan with the points in the center overlap them so they fit have got eight pancakes a lot for four of us but it's just not in my nature to provide just enough food for one helping each couldn't do it and this is the glory everything gets done in advance the sole goujon are ready the dill mayonnaise is ready this is ready so once the pancakes have warmed through in the syrup there. I shall heat up a little bit of orange liqueur in this pan again, pour it over the pancakes, take it off the flame, hold it away from me and set fire to it. Oh, it's going to be fabulous. Right, so that's done and I've got a few minutes before my guests arrive, so I'll do a bit of last minute fiddling at the table, a few plates and platters, that kind of thing. It's done. <laughs> I come bearing goujons. Mm. Like some. I adore some. Do you remember these when everything came in a basket? It was Soup in a basket when the old jokes. The scampi was very, yeah. very, yes. very posh. What about mm. small cocktail with nari rose sauce, oh, black rose batter? <laughs> Taking me back. Back home, we always used to have fish and chips. Mm. So this is just. And in a way, this is this was a restaurant version of fish and chips, mm. wasn't it? Must leave some room there. Anyway, behave while I set fire to my crepe Suzette. You know how to make crepes, Suzette? So some butter, sugar and orange juice, which I'm going to pour in. I'm going to heat up some orange liqueur, then I'm going to toss it over the powder of pancakes and I'm going to set fire to it. Adrian, please, if you would, dim the lights. So beautiful. I'm going to take them out now. Look, they get all sort of spongy and billowy with syrup and liqueur. Oh, look, it's almost glazed, these pancakes. They're now like little sticky rags. Ta da! Yay! I'm salivating the very thought of it. I'm really glad I kept some space for this because this is absolutely fantastic. It so reminds me of all that sort of the mystique and the drama and the wonder of going to restaurants with my granny when they used to flambe. Now I can do it. <laughs> <laughs>